Okay, I think it's time to start. So welcome everybody. It's again my pleasure to welcome you to the Global Immunotalks. Uh, we have today Emily Tremel from UCSD. But before my co-organizer Elina Soniga gets to introduce Emily, I would just like to briefly remind you about our goals, which are to benefit and inspire immunologists across the world in an egalitarian manner and to really increase the opportunities for the scientific uh, interactions and scientific learning without uh, traveling. Now, of course, we would not be able to do this. Oh, sorry, that was way too fast. Uh, we would not be able to do this without our fabulous speakers that have agreed uh, to present. And as I said, today we have Emily, who I know is right there, but needs to get uh, to the video and voice. Hopefully that will happen soon. I think there she is, there she is. Uh, and uh, just would like to remind you that next week we'll have Yetmar Sen joining us uh, as a global immuno speaker. So with this, I'll stop sharing our goals and I'll ask my friend and uh, co-organizer Elina Suniga to get to introduce Emily. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much, Carly. Uh, it is, of course, a pleasure and a gift to introduce to you my dear colleague and my dear friend, Emily Tremel. So Emily is a native from uh, US, uh, Minnesota, uh, but she's also an international uh, speaker because not only she loves uh, to travel to know more about uh, many countries outside the US, but also she was actually living in Japan in 1992. Uh, so Emily uh, received her bachelor degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and then her PhD degree from the University of California in San Francisco. And it was there when she started uh, working with C. elegans, and she identified the first chemosensory receptors uh, in this model. So uh, after her PhD, Emily uh, took like an interesting uh, twist and she helped launch a startup biotechnology company uh, where she studied questions about the neuronal identity and neuroinflammation. And after this company went public, she returned to academia for a postdoctoral training. And that was uh, in uh, 2005. She did a, uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School at the laboratory of Fred Auswell. And it was there when she identified the first natural pathogens of C. elegans uh, that she named uh, Nematocida parisi. Maybe she can tell us the story uh, <laughs> behind that name later. Uh, and this defines a new genus and a species of microsporidia, which are priority pathogens of medical and agricultural significance. So after her postdoc, Emily uh, joined UCSD as assistant professor in 2008. And there was when I had the, the gift and delight uh, to meet Emily. We were, our laboratories were very close, just uh, uh, in the same, uh, one floor uh, apart. And um, it was very nice to talk to her about science and non-science stuff in these initial years and, and the subsequent years as, as well after she joined UCSD. So she scaled very quickly through the ranks and she's now full professor at the Division of Biological Sciences at UCSD. And here at UCSD, Emily has continued using uh, this same natural host pathogen system in C. elegans to determine how microsporidia causes diseases and uh, as well as the mechanisms uh, that are general for response of the host to intracellular pathogens. And indeed, uh, she uh, recently found that some of these same mechanisms that uh, the host uh, cells use to respond to microsporidia are conserved in the response to an orsite virus. And so I cannot wait to hear more about that uh, from Emily today. <laughs> 
So I feel very gifted to have Emily as a friend and colleague. I enjoy and have benefited from many of our scientific discussions. And I admire Emily deeply uh, for her generosity, for her courage, for her intelligence uh, to, that allow her to successfully establish a new model system to, establish, to study natural host uh, pathogen interactions that not only allow Emily to ask and answer difficult questions that advanced the field, mm -hmm. but it's now there available for many others uh, to benefit. And so these uh, great contributions that Emily has made uh, to the field have been published in numerous uh, prestigious uh, publications. And also Emily has been honored with a great uh, list of awards, uh, including the Searle Scholar Award, Ray Thomas Edward Foundation Award, David and Lucy Packer Award, Bureau Welcome Fund, uh, Fund Award, and I could continue mentioning, but it's actually a long list, and one anecdote I can share with you uh, about how successful and how uh, used we were about hearing uh, Emily's uh, getting awards is that in one of our uh, faculty meetings, one time the dean started uh, the meeting saying that the news of the quarter was that Emily hasn't gotten an award on that quarter. So <laughs> that's how often uh, we were uh, uh, used to uh, hear about uh, her amazing recognitions. So um, Emily, we are very uh, uh, thankful that you have accepted to be a global immune speaker and that for all your efforts to prepare this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. That's a very kind introduction. I'm not sure I can live up to it, but it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm so grateful to both you and Carla for putting together this series that enables people around the globe to share and learn about the latest in immunology. And I've really learned a lot. I've been really enjoying it and I'm humbled to be part of the lineup. Thank you. And we love to have you here, Emily. And so I told you how I, I, I admire Emily for her intelligence, her courage, but also uh, for how she knows how to live a full life. And so she's not only a runner, a swimmer, a climber, and a scuba diver, but more recently she has uh, become very knowledgeable about mindfulness. And so, Taking that into consideration, we want to ask Emily today, uh, what does she think, how mindfulness can help a scientist? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think there's a lot of tools from mindfulness that can help scientists. And I was really lucky that here at UC San Diego, we have a center for mindfulness that offers courses in this, in this discipline. So I would say very briefly, three tools that are useful for scientists, the first of which is, the concept of beginner's mind. So there's a quote from the Zen teacher Suzuki that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities and in the expert's minds, there are few, which is not to diminish experts, but rather to say when we become experts in our field, we sometimes forget about certain avenues and directions or we may not know about them. And so I think by really encouraging beginners in our field, we can then find new directions and get reminded about ones we've just forgotten about. Um, and also as experts to cultivate that beginner's mind. The second thing I would say is the tool of holding our stories lightly. And so this is a concept where, you know, we have incomplete information about anything, about another person, about a uh, uh, situation, and about science. And really our goal with science is to get to truth. And we have these hypotheses that we put together that are, you know, incomplete and imperfect, and we want to hold them lightly. So holding our hypotheses lightly, we don't try to prove them, but yet use them to get to truth. So hold on to what's consistent with our hypothesis, but let go of what's not consistent. And then the third thing I would say, it relates to the concept of awareness. And a lot of the mindfulness discipline is paying attention on purpose without judgment. And one of the things that can be challenging is paying attention to emotions in particular, but they play a really big role in science. So the emotions of like, Oh, something's wrong with this experiment and sometimes maybe there's not the right control that's done or it's a direction you don't want to go but also being aware and cultivating the emotions of, of sort of joy and delight and finding something new 
and the the awe in how well designed well i won't say necessarily well designed but intricately designed biological systems are and how resilient they can be to stressors like pathogen infection that's fantastic emily thank you so much for sharing that wisdom i think it's very helpful thank you so much okay so if you would like to share your screen all right let's go to um yeah my First slide, which is a very brief nonpartisan reminder to ask anybody in whatever country you're in, if you are able to choose your elected leadership, please exercise that, that, um, that right. I'm going to tell you about, um, as Alina mentioned, this host that we're studying, the nematode C. elegans, and how it responds to a natural intracellular pathogen, which is labeled here in red, and it's growing inside the green labeled intestine of this small roundworm C. elegans. I'm going to divide, um, so sorry, to back up a second. So this interaction of this pathogen with this host is part of a more general area I think all of us in this seminar series are really interested in, and that's just the general question of how do pathogens and hosts interact with each other with the idea they could teach us so much about biology, can teach us medically and agriculturally relevant information about strategies that pathogens use to attack hosts how hosts defend themselves against the, these attacks, their immune responses, but also these interactions can teach us about some basic cell biology since microbes are good cell biologists. And what I mean by this is that they've had, in some cases, millions of years to evolve really sophisticated strategies to exploit host cell biology so they can survive and replicate. And microbes have been at this much longer than humans and so they have a lot to teach us about um, eukaryotic cell biology. The first part of my talk is going to describe background on this host system and the natural pathogen that infects it and how it restructures the host to facilitate its life cycle. And this natural pathogen that um, uh, Elena mentioned, it's in the microsporidia phylum, and we found somewhat surprisingly that the host transcriptional response to this pathogen is very similar to the response to a very different pathogen, an RNA virus. Through studying regulators of this response, we've identified a number of physiological changes that result from this response, including some changes that are then informing us about some of the basic cell biology of the system. So C. elegans has been a powerful model for questions of neurobiology and developmental biology for 50 plus years. And it's really only more recently that it's been a model for um, questions of immunology, but here it provides a number of advantages for studying intestinal infections in particular. So C. elegans has a simple body plan of just a thousand cells, 20 of which are epithelial cells that make up the intestine that run the length of the animal. And since these worms are transparent, we can look at this intestine in the living animal during an infection without the need for dissection. These cells are regularly encountering microbes um, because worms feed on microbes. In the lab, we feed them a steady diet of E. coli bacteria, but out in the wild, they encounter a wide range of different microbes, some of which can become pathogenic. And C. elegans is fighting off these infections without a lot of the cells and pathways that are familiar to mammalian immunologists. So first off, C. elegans doesn't have a classic adaptive immune system with T cells and B cells and antibodies. But also, as far as we know, it's fighting off infection without dedicated um, immune cells, so-called professional immune cells, like phagocytic um, cells such as macrophages or neutrophils. And so um, we think they're really predominantly relying on um, non-professional immune cells, such as epithelial cells. So this host um, intestine is a lot simpler um, in C. elegans than in mammalian systems, but the cells themselves have a lot of similarities, which are illustrated here um, with this electron micrograph of a human intestinal epithelial cell and a C. elegans intestinal epithelial cell. In both cases, they have these finger-like microvilli that are anchored into a cytoskeletal structure that's called the terminal web. There are conserved um, proteins that set up the polarity in these systems, as well as trafficking proteins, and so many, many things in common. One thing that's different, though, is that C. elegans intestinal cells are non-renewable. So it's not an option to just kill off a highly infected cell and replace it with a new one. Rather, it appears that C. elegans is really carefully protecting these cells because it's born with 20 cells, has those same 20 cells when it dies a few weeks later. So again, I wanna um, do a little bit more comparison in particular because this seminar series has focused on mammalian immunology and 
describe just very high level view of what's present and absent in C. elegans immune signaling pathways compared to mammals and it's from work of many different labs. First off, just to um, highlight that there are some key components in the mammalian detection system that are absent in C. elegans, including intracellular receptors such as nucleotide um, binding leucine rich repeat receptors and sting C gas. Um, they're used for detecting intracellular infection and C. elegans are absent in um, use for detecting intracellular pathogens in mammals um, are, are not present in C. elegans. C. elegans has one toll-like receptor and unlike an in insect and mammalian immunity where it's very important for innate immunity, it seems to play just a minor role if any in C. elegans immunity, although it's important for development. One of the themes that's come from studying C. elegans response to infection is that it seems to have immune signaling pathways triggered by damage. So beautiful work from Jonathan Eubanks lab has shown how a fungal pathogen that damages that um, uh, penetrates the epidermis of the worm triggers a G-protein signaling cascade to provide defense. Work from a number of labs, including my own, has described how C. elegans is sensing infection through the effects of virulence factors. So for example, work from my lab, Ocebel lab, and Revkin lab had shown that C. elegans is not detecting the shape of a toxin from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but rather the effects on blocking host translation elongation. In terms of signaling, there's a notable absence in the C. elegans genome of the nf kappa D transcription factor that's really important in um, uh, insect and mammalian immunity. But they do have conserved P38 MAP kinase pathway that um, is very important for defense against fungal and um, bacterial pathogens that are extracellular, such as um, upregulating um, expression of secreted antimicrobials. So in terms of the outputs, um, there's differences in terms of a lack of um, canonical cytokines like interferons, but as I mentioned, we think a really important mode of defense against um, uh, extracellular pathogens is secreting antimicrobial peptides like C-type lectins, and worms have expanded gene families in these classes. So um, it's still, I think, relatively early days. There's only been about 20 years that we've been um, looking at C. elegans immunity, but I think we're getting a, a growing picture. Um, and I think in terms of where there's still really open questions is this question of how they truly are detecting infection. And I think as sort of highlighting the kinds of novel insights that can be gained from studying systems like C. elegans, I just want to highlight a really um, a uh, revolutionary finding from C. elegans that was granted the Nobel Prize um, to Andy Fire and Craig Mallow several years ago, discovering this process of RNA interference, which regulates gene expression, and that's a key form of antiviral defense in C. elegans. So C. elegans can be affected by a number of different um, pathogens, and uh, early work really focused on clinically relevant bacterial pathogens, including this um, gram-negative pathogen, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So um, these, the strains of pathogens that are used uh, to infect C. elegans in the lab from these species have provided a, a lot of insight into the, the responses that I described earlier, although they're not known to be natural pathogens of C. elegans, at least not staph or salmonella, and the strain of pseudomonas used in the lab came from a human burn victim. So when I began my postdoc in Fred Ossebel's lab, I was really interested in what did C. elegans evolve to defend itself against? Um, and through those um, efforts and collaborations found the, these eukaryotic pathogens called microsporidia that I'll describe more in the next slide. And um, work from other groups um, has found more recently these eukaryotic pathogens in the Omicete family are natural pathogens of C. elegans. And there's a um, RNA virus that came from Orsay, France that's also a natural pathogen of C. elegans. So microsporidia has really been a major focus of work in my lab, um, and microsporidia appear to be the most common cause of infection for C. elegans in the wild. Um, and this work began in uh, Paris, France, where a compost pit near Paris was found to harbor a strain of worms that had intracellular microbes. And this is work from um, the wonderful Marianne Felix in her lab, um, where they were sampling this um, rich source of C. elegans, which is compost pits, um, and they found a strain of worms that had intracellular microbes and generously shared with um, me that strain so I could analyze it. And it's shown here where um, this is the intestine of the worm with the lumen, and there's a rod-shaped microbe here, is something you'd never see in a lab strain of C. elegans. And even though it looked like bacteria, um, and we thought it was bacteria for a while, one of those wrong turns in science, we righted it and realized that it's actually not bacteria despite looking like it. 
um, but yet rather defines a new genus and species of microsporidia, these eukaryotic pathogens, um, and we named it <laughs> Nematocida precii, which means nematode killer from Paris. So <laughs> this nematode killer from Paris um, is just the first of many different uh, species and genera now of microsporidia that have been found infecting wild-caught worms, C. elegans, and related nematodes from all these different places. So this is really largely the efforts of Marianne Felix, um, together with my lab and um, trainees from my lab, Robert Lou Allen and Aaron Renke, who now have their own labs. So it's still a growing list. This is out of date, but just to give you a sense of um, a few years ago, we had 47 strains from all these locations and three different genera. And microsporidia um, don't just infect C. elegans, they actually infect a wide range of hosts, all the way from single-celled protists, all the way up to humans. And there's, um, it's a whole phylum of over 1,400 species, and 14 of these can infect humans, where they can cause um, lethal diarrhea. Uh, they most commonly infect the intestine and um, predominantly appear to be a problem for immunocompromised patients. So these are obligate intracellular pathogens, which means you can't grow them outside of the host. And that may, means they're a bit challenging to work with. And so our new system of this simple host C. elegans provided an opportunity to learn more about microsporidia pathogenesis and host response. So microsporidia um, can't replicate outside of a host, but they survive outside of a host in the spore form that's the transmissible form um, that has this really specialized infection apparatus called the polar tube highlighted here in red and it's coiled inside of a spore until that spore receives the right cue to, to deploy that polar tube. And so this is a video from Jamie Becknell, who studies uh, microsporidia infecting mosquitoes and other insects. And um, this video shows you a real-time deployment of this infection apparatus, which is a dramatic event. It's gonna fire here from some of these guys. Um, and this event has just fascinated biologists for decades. And I guess as an example of the, the um, benefit of beginner's mind coming in, uh, a few years ago, um, Gira, uh, Baba and Damien Eckert were, were newcomers to the field and they've now applied beautiful high-speed imaging to understand this um, firing mechanism um, and in particular describing how the parasite nucleus that gets shot through that tube squishes. The, anyway, I encourage you to check out this paper. It's really beautiful. So that um, Fire tube, firing of that polar tube is used to deliver a parasite cell directly into a host cell. And in our Ampricii infection of C. elegans, we can actually see this when minutes after feeding worms this pathogen. The sporoplasm will replicate in a multinucleate structure called a mirant that then differentiates into spores, and those spores will then exit into the lumen where they can be defecated out to infect new hosts. The intestine will fill up to quite a large um, dramatic degree, which I'll explain in a second, while worms still um, are impressively well able to move around and reproduce, but they do ultimately die prematurely from this infection. So hence the name nematocida or nematode killer. To give you a sense of how um, sort of intimately connected this, this pathogen and host are, this is an electron micrograph of an intestinal epithelial cell where you can see false colored here in purple is a muron with multiple nuclei that's in direct contact with the host cytoplasm. There's no separate compartment. It really is like a new organelle, membrane bound organelle within the cell. We can also see the spore, um, which actually does later on, we found have a separate compartment around it. And in this case, it's got this polar tube that's developing inside of it. So over the years, we've looked at a number of different aspects of how this parasite life cycle um, leads to restructuring of the host to facilitate its, um, its uh, replication and exit. And, um, and from work a while ago, described some restructuring events that we think facilitate exit, including very um, striking gaps that appear in this terminal web at precisely the time that spores form and begin to exit into the lumen. So we think this may be removing a barrier to exit for these parasites. And the exit itself is a non-lytic exit that is hijacking host components, including the small GTPs RAB11, that is um, involved in recycling the material back to the apical side. So this is a directional exit where the parasite only exits um, back into the lumen and does it in a non-lytic manner. So, and it's impressive the, the way this parasite can cause its host to become really a spore factory. So a single worm with just 20 cells can shed hundreds to thousands of spores per worm per hour and do that for hours and hours um, before ultimately dying from this infection.
So one of the earlier aspects of the life cycle that we've been interested in, and I'll show you some primary data, is work asking whether this life cycle is a cell autonomous process. We'd always kind of been cartooning it that way with the invasion, replication, and differentiation all happening in the same cell. But a former grad student in my lab, Kirbala, found that it's actually, uh, there's some um, spreading that's occurring with this infection. And so he developed conditions to infect a single intestinal cell with a single parasite. So this is an image of a worm, the head and the tail, the intestine labeled here in green, nuclei in blue, and he um, got conditions where you can just get a single parasite cell infecting a single host cell. And then look at what happens. And what he found was pretty dramatic. So within a couple days, you then see a worm after a single spore infection has this parasite spread and labeled here in red throughout the intestine. And you can see very little host tissue in this particular image. Blue shows you the intestinal nuclei, and then this is actually the germline. So as I said, the worm can keep reproducing despite the fact its intestine is becoming parasite. Kier quantified this as shown in this graph with um, time on the x-axis and volume of the parasite on the y-axis with these black dots showing how the parasite gets larger over time. And then um, the red dots are the y-axis of the percentage of intestine occupied by parasite. And after a couple days, from a single parasite, the pathogen has become over half the volume of the intestine. Here, it looked at how this proceeds by using a strain of worms that has the membranes of the intestines labeled in green, and early you can see the parasite in red here is restricted to the boundaries of one intestinal cell. But as it grows, oh, <laughs> my, my lights went out. Um, um, <laughs> so the, uh, let's keep the lights on. So this um, parasite, as it's growing labeled here in red, starts to deform the host cell membrane, as you can see a little bit more clearly if we take about the red staining, that green um, deformation as the parasite pushes into a neighboring cell. Unfortunately, we don't have live labeling methods in microsporidia. There's no um, genetics or transformation in a system. So when we've done live imaging, it's been through looking at sort of the absence of staining in a host stained tissue. So this is um, showing you imaging of a C. elegans intestine label here in green. The video is going to run again. Um, and this dark spot is a NPCI murat on one side of an intestinal cell boundary and pushing through to the other side. So this was published a year ago, so uh, or year, several years ago, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but Kier did really beautiful work um, to show that when that parasite is spreading, um, he used dendro photoconvertible um, uh, fluorescent protein to show that actually they're sharing across these different cells of cytoplasmic contents. So what used to be 20 separate cells in the intestine actually becomes this shared space. And um, this really, um, impressive ability of n to turn the intestine incision. We were wondering if that's something that is also accomplished by other species of microsporidia and other organs. And so here, Kier teamed up with a grad student, Robert Llewellyn, um, who had discovered another species of nematocida together with Marianne. Um, he named it nematocida displodair because it explodes out of the worm. It doesn't do that nonlytic exit. Um, and it doesn't do very well when it infects the intestine. It rarely replicates. And when it does, it can't spread into neighboring cells. But what um, Robert found was that if you infect a single muscle cell with n air, it will spread throughout that muscle tissue, indicating that air um, can cause its tissue where it replicates uh, most, uh, replicates the best is where it can also create a syncytion. And so this was a pretty new, exciting finding in microsporidia. So I did mention that microsporidia have been known since the time of Louis Pasteur. He actually found one of the first species as the cause of disease in silkworm. And it really had just been thought the way microsporidia goes from cell to cell is with that polar tube invasion. And what Kier found is that here's a new way that microsporidia can spread and it's a more efficient way because it doesn't have to go through that differentiation and invasion process, but rather can spread from cell to cell uh, to really facilitate its, its replication. So how is C. elegans responding to all this restructuring happening from this parasite that's so well adapted to his host tissue? So that's what I'm going to talk about in um, this next part of the talk. And first, just very briefly tell you um, a little of what we know about the, the molecular nature of microsporidia. I mentioned they're not bacteria, they're eukaryotic, um, and they have the award of having the smallest known eukaryotic genomes. 
the first genome that was sequenced is a human pathogen called encephalitazone cuniculi, and it only has 2.9 megabase genomes, so smaller than many bacterial species. When I first found NPreCI, I was interested in describing what its genome was like and also what the genome of other microsporidia are like because at that time we just had the cuniculi genome. And so I um, established a collaboration with Christina Cuomo at the Broad Institute and we uh, put together a consortium of microsporidia researchers and got funding from the NAID to sequence the genomes of microsporidia species that infect um, a wide range of different hosts and um, findings from that are, are, are published in this uh, manuscript where we describe uh, shared strategies for pathogenesis that's, that's found across microsporidia genomes. A relevance for this talk, um, we found the MPCI genome um, was quite small. And I also want to comment in terms of beginner's mind, because I was a beginner coming to the microsporidia field, and I was really um, supported and welcomed by a lot of the researchers in the field. I'm very grateful to them for that. Um, I did receive some discouragement about sequencing microsporidia genomes. I was told, oh, they're filled with repeats, you'll never assemble them, and um, that didn't actually end up being the case. And this this genome and many others came together quite well and, and of course sequencing technology has been advancing so rapidly to facilitate this. So the small genome has 2600 genes and we are most interested in the genes that encode proteins that will interface with host tissue and here's where work from a former postdoc in my lab, Aaron Renke, who's now um, running his own lab in Toronto, he did just a beautiful job taking what was at that time a newly developed technique from Alice Ting's lab, um, spatially restricted enzymatic tagging, and he adapted that to C. elegans and microsporidia and did localized proteomics to try to experimentally identify which of the pathogen proteins are interfacing with host tissue, and he identified a number of families of um, pneumatocetic proteins um, and over uh, 90 proteins total that um, have high confidence of being interactors either with the host cytoplasm or the nucleus. So it appears there's a lot of different microsporidia proteins that are interfacing to, with host tissue to either, um, like I showed you, kind of restructure the host cell biology or is what I'm going to tell you next um, to trigger transcriptional responses. And so as part of that collaboration with the Broad where we did RNA-seq um, of parasite life cycle at different stages, we also looked at the host because it's all embedded together and you can uh, measure RNA from both at the same time. This was driven by my postdoc Molina, who's now an investigator at the California Institute for Biomedical Research. And Molina um, analyzed the C. elegans transcriptional response to infection at these different time points when the parasite is growing and then when it's differentiated and really taken over um, the whole intestine. She looked at genes regulated by NPreCI and then compared them to genes regulated by other stressors and bacterial and fungal pathogens and found um, some but relatively limited similarity to the response to these other triggers. Or she found that the most striking similarity was with response to um, a molecularly very distinct parasite uh, pathogen called the Orsay virus. So the Orsay virus was discovered by Marianne Felix together with Dave Wang and similar to our uh, virus of interest in the news these days, SARS-CoV-2, a coronavirus, it's a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus. So right after it invades a cell, it can get its RNA translated into protein. As many fewer genes than coronavirus, only three genes. Um, so that's why we were, you know, we were kind of surprised initially it's an inducing a really similar set of genes as this much more complicated fungal-related pathogen and preCI with its thousands of genes and probably hundreds of proteins that are interfacing with the host. What they have in common is that they're both natural intracellular pathogens of the C. elegans intestine. And so um, for that reason, we thought maybe they're triggering a, a really key immune stress response in C. elegans and let's uncover that. And this is where I wanna hold our stories lightly because this is certainly a work in progress of what is actually um, mechanistically happening uh, with this response. But for convenience sake, our, our model, our um, description of this response is the intracellular pathogen response or IPR. And these genes encode um, many genes of unknown function, but um, include some genes that are predicted to be ubiquitin ligase components. Um, that's involved, of course, in the process of um, tagging proteins with ubiquitin that alters their fate, um, oftentimes for degradation. So how can these very molecularly distinct um, pathogens trigger a common set of genes? So our sort of simple approach was, well, maybe they have some common physiological impact on the host. 
And I mentioned that's been a theme in a number of different C. elegans host pathogen studies that um, C. elegans are sensing the effects of pathogens to trigger defense responses. And um, we focused in terms of what might be the common impact of these is sort of on the, um, the proteostasis, the protein homeostasis of the cell, because we saw those ubiquitin ligases upregulated. Um, and we knew that it's a real burden on a host to, for example, accommodate that and pre-CI parasite taking over the whole, the whole uh, organ and that's like keep your proteins well folded um, is a challenge. And perhaps there's just a lot of burden on sending certain proteins that are misfolded to the proteasome. So Melina um, had noticed uh, that there are hallmarks of there being a block in the proteasome or some kind of proteotoxic stress upon microsporidia and viral infection. So that's shown here with the C. elegans intestine having a ubiquitin tagged uh, with GFP and it forms these aggregates, um, sometimes near the parasite, sometimes further away. And so to test this model, or maybe it's proteotoxic stress that's inducing these genes in common, she analyzed whether um, blocking the proteasome either pharmacologically or genetically would turn on IPR genes. And so this shows you a GFP reporter we have for the IPR. It's a gene of unknown function um, called PALS5, but um, really useful readout for infection. If, you, if we take the promoter driving GFP, it's expressed very lowly in uninfected animals and very strongly in infected animals. And it's also strongly in um, upregulated if you block the proteasome. So Melina also did quantitative PCR and found a number of different genes are up um, in common between infection and proteasome blockade. And more recently, we've done RNA-seq to um, look at the whole genome um, to find what's in common. And here we found that if we take our top IPR genes, 80 genes, and then um, compare to which genes are induced by blockade of the proteasome with um, the drug Bortezum, we find that 75 of them are also induced. And so um, I just want to highlight for those of you who might be aficionados of um, proteasome blockade and proteostasis that there is a well-described response to proteasome inhibition that's conserved from worms to mammals. Um, it's called the bounce back response where you block the proteasome, you turn off expression of proteasome subunits as sort of a compensatory response. Um, and that's mediated by a conserved transcription factor called skin one and C. elegans, nerve two in mammals. And that's distinct from what we're looking at here. We don't see infection inducing proteasome subunits. Rather, we see induction of these ubiquitin ligases that could be acting upstream of the proteasome um, and these PALS genes. So um, that simple model uh, we thought could be true, but yet there was certain aspects of it that um, weren't so satisfying. Um, one of which is we saw these IPR genes in, be induced quite early with infection before there's really um, obvious proteotoxic stress. And so for that reason, we thought, and others, we thought maybe there's a more specific sort of ligand and receptor um, from these parasites that's triggering this response. And so this is um, work that was um, uh, tackled by Jessica Soa, who was a postdoc in the lab. She's now a faculty member at Westchester University in Pennsylvania. And she was really interested in this question, particularly in light of what I mentioned before, that C. elegans lacks a lot of the canonical immune receptors and signaling found in mammals. So how is it sensing this infection? One receptor C. elegans does have in common um, that has been shown important to be important for immunity is a receptor in the rigi like receptor family that in mammals plays a very important role in detecting RNA virus infection. These um, uh, receptors rigi and MDA5 have a protein structure shown here where they can bind to viral replication products, including double stranded RNA, to then activate a signaling cascade to turn on through MAVs. Um, uh, ERF3 transcription factor that activates expression of interferon on that powerful um, antiviral interferon response. C. elegans lacks MAVs, ERF3, and interferon, but it does have um, rigi like receptors that are called DRH for dicer related helicases, including DRH1. And work from many labs has shown that DRH1 is important for sensing viral infection in C. elegans, um, both that Orsay virus, natural virus, as well as um, sort of lab uh, viral infections. And um, instead of triggering this transcriptional response of interferon, it activates antiviral RNAi to degrade viral RNA. So we were interested in whether DRH1 might also be activating, like in mammals, a transcriptional response to infection. 
And here we were really fortunate to collaborate um, with uh, Dave Wang and Hong Bing Zhang at WashU, and um, together with Jessica, we found that um, DRH1 is very important for triggering the IPR upon viral infection. And first, just to show you what that looks like with our GFP reporter that's induced by viral infection in wild type animals. If you look in a DRH1 mutant, that reporter is no longer induced. So Jessica quantified this um, with our worm sorter. So for those of you who do facts, this is like a fact sorter for worms. Um, and this graph of the y-axis shows you GFP fluorescence from this reporter being induced. Um, each of these dots is an individual worm. So um, you can see there's induction upon infection in wild type animals, but really no induction in DRH1 mutants. So a uh, sort of simple explanation could be, well, maybe these mutants just aren't getting infected, but um, that's not the case. Actually, the, um, the mutants are infected to a higher degree than wild type animals as uh, measuring viral RNA with qPCR. So Jessica was interested in whether DRH1 was required for triggering the IPR in response to other triggers and so looked at um, DRH1 mutants for whether they still induce the IPR reporter with microsporidia infection. And she found, as shown here, that just like wild tip animals um, that induce the reporter upon NPCI infection, DRH1 mutants will also induce the reporter, and actually to a greater degree than in wild type animals. Similarly, when she looked at GFP um, induction with proteasome blockade with this drug bortezomib, she found you know, wild type animals induce this GFP reporter as do DRH1 mutants and actually to a higher degree. So that then indicated our simple model was incomplete, that in addition to proteotoxic stress um, inducing IPR, that there is a specific receptor that um, is acting in parallel, this rigai like receptor DRH1. So um, Jessica confirmed using quantitative PCR, looking at endogenous RNA for PALS5, as well as other IPR genes that are induced in wild type worms, not in DRH1 mutants. And she wanted to then compare this with what had been previously described for DRH1 and directing antiviral RNA, where RNA, antiviral RNAi, um, where it's been defined other factors, double-stranded RNA proteins, dicer, that cleaves um, double-stranded RNA and argonauts that are important for antiviral RNAi, and whether they're important for inducing our IPR. And she found um, using qPCR that these other factors um, are not required for inducing IPR genes, indicating that DRH1 is acting in parallel um, here, it, to, acting separately to induce the IPR um, and compared to inducing antiviral RNAi. So we wanted to know what component of the Orsay virus was triggering this response, and through analogy, we expected would be some uh, form of viral replication, for example, double-stranded RNA. And Jessica very valiantly tried to define that using methods to soak worms with these different um, potential triggers and directly inject, and ultimately those experiments were inconclusive. And so she took a genetic approach to understand this and using um, some very useful, some really valuable tools developed by Hong Bing Zhang and um, Dave Wang lab. So a genetic approach, just to remind you, this Orsay virus is a bipartite genome with two RNA segments that encode um, three genes. And um, Hong Bing had developed a strain of C. elegans that ectopically expresses just this RNA1 segment that has a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase encoded. And so he expressed either um, RNA1 with an active or with uh, uh, mutations that should inactivate the polymerase. And just to sort of explain what this would do, uh, you know, if you've got an RNA1 segment that's topically expressed with an active polymerase, it can then make a second copy of that RNA to generate double-stranded RNA. And if the um, polymerase is inactive, it can't um, replicate that double-stranded RNA, and so it will just remain single-stranded. So with these um, strains, we monitored IPR gene expression, um, and Hong Bing had originally seen our IPR reporter went on with expression of this um, this construct. And what Jessica did was to expand that um, to qPCR and actually do RNA-seq that was a very satisfying result in terms of indicating that ectopic expression of that um, RNA1 segment was sufficient to induce most of our IPR genes. So of the top 80 IPR genes, 62 of them are induced by ectopic expression of just this RNA1 segment. It's dependent on DRH1 because um, the DR1 mutant RNA-seq showed that very few of these were still induced. 
and it's independent of um, RNAi because, um, or at least canonical RNAi factors because it's performed in an RNAi deficient background. So altogether, this indicates that um, uh, the Orsay virus is being sensed through this DRH1 receptor to trigger IPR gene expression in parallel to its previously described role in RNAi. And um, we think that some, we don't know exactly what molecule is being detected, but suspect based on the um, genetic experiments, it's some form of viral replication um, products like double-stranded RNA or perhaps five prime triphosphorylated RNA, some replication product. So we're, of course, really excited to understand more about this mechanism, especially as I mentioned that um, C. elegans is lacking some of these um, downstream signaling components that are found in mammals. And so we're approaching this from several different directions, and so stay tuned for that. Um, and one of the directions we're using to approach it is to identify um, through genetic approaches other regulators of, of IPR genes. So that takes me to the third part of the talk where I'm going to describe to you um, what we've learned in terms of what is the effect of upregulating all these genes and, and what is this telling us about defense and cell biology. So genetic screens have been facilitated by this workhorse um, GFP reporter for PALS5 um, that induces expression of GFP in the intestine upon infection. And we've done a number of genetic screens, including one of the first by uh, project scientists in the lab, Kirthi Reddy, who just did a very simple screen to mutagenize this GFP reporter and in the F2 generation screen for worms that have it expressed in the absence of infection. In her first screen, she found three mutants that failed to complement each other and all um, ended up being alleles um, within this gene called PALS22. So um, this PALS gene family, I want to go into a little bit more depth explaining. We don't know what these um, PALS genes are doing. I think I, I didn't mention earlier, the, the closest clue we have based on sequence is that they're distant really related to FBOX genes that encode adapters in ubiquitin ligases, but we don't necessarily know that's what they're doing. Um, but they are a large gene family that seems to play a really important role in C. elegans um, response to intracellular infection. So C. elegans has 39 of these genes. Um, it's expanded compared to other senior of Ditis genomes. Humans and mice have one gene each of um, unknown biochemical or um, sort of biological significance. The 39 PALS genes in C. elegans, when you put them in a phylogenetic tree, the ones here in green, the cluster together, are all induced by microsporidia and virus infection. And through using this um, highly induced uh, PALS5 uh, GFP reporter, and I mentioned we just found a negative regulator um, called PALS22. And PALS22 keeps off PALS5 in the absence of infection, as well as all of these other PALS genes and other IPR genes. Um, PALS22 itself is not regulated by infection. It's actually in this um, group of uh, unregulated PALS genes. So as geneticists, we like to like, okay, well, we're going to learn something by doing more genetic screens. And so we continue to do more screening um, to find more regulators, thinking we would get away from the PALS genes, um, <laughs> or at least find um, genes that have predicted biochemical function. And so a suppressor screen that Kirthi did to take um, these constitutively expressing um, mutants that have the GFP on and then look for suppressor uh, mutations identified another PALS gene. So she found um, a gene called PALS25 that is required for the upregulation of PALS5 and PALS22 mutants, as well as all all of these other genes. We've done RNA-seq. All of these genes that are turned on by infection in PALS22 mutants pretty much come back down um, uh, in a PALS25 mutant. So also like PALS22, PALS25 is not regulated. And so I want to um, just comment on how this reminded me a little bit of a myth of like what, where, what's underneath the earth. And there's a myth that's attributed to many different cultures um, that underneath the earth is a turtle. And what's under that turtle is another turtle. And what's under that turtle is another turtle. So in some ways, um, it seems like it's turtles all the way down with all these PALS genes. But they are really fascinating genes um, that, as I'll show you in a second, are re rewiring C. elegans physiology. Um, because they're in the same family and paralogs and direct opposite outcomes, we call them antagonistic paralogs. And the PALS22 and 25 genes, interestingly, are in the same region of the genome and in an operon. So C. elegans organizes some of their genes um, in these transcriptional units, and PALS22 and 25 are actually transcribed together. 
So there's a number of features in common actually that are kind of beyond the scope of this talk. I'd be happy to um, discuss offline or by Twitter about uh, conceptual similarities between this on-off switch for the infection in C. elegans and um, antagonistic par paralogs in plant immunity that are involved in sensing pathogens. For now though, I would say um, a quote from my undergraduate advisor, Judith Kimball, that says, if a protein screams out to you of its biological importance, it's worth the effort to figure it out. And so um, here we've been fortunate to be collaborating with structural biologists at Scribble at NYU in efforts to, uh, to figure out sort of the more about the structural and biochemical nature of these proteins. But I can say they have a lot of biological importance. Um, first for what they do in terms of controlling resistance to intracellular pathogens. So this graph shows you um, pathogen load on the y-axis. Each of these dots is an animal. Um, uh, basically, it's reading out a level of ribosomal RNA in the parasite. And uh, you can see there's a much higher level of pathogen load in wild-type animals compared to both of these mutant alleles of PALS-22. So they're resistant to infection, but then that's suppressed if you've lost um, function in PALS-25. Similarly, these guys act as an on-off switch for resistance to viral infection. And in contrast to what they're doing with controlling resistance to um, natural intracellular pathogens, they seem to be increasing susceptibility to extracellular pathogens. So PALS-22 mutants have increased pathogen load of this extracellular bacterial pathogen, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and that's suppressed by PALS-25. So this on-off switch for resistance to natural pathogens, um, as I showed you, is um, affecting resistance to intestinal pathogens, but through a completely independent um, set of screens, we ended up collaborating with Michaela Sparkoulis, who studies these oomycete pathogens that infect the epidermis of C. elegans. He independently found these as an on-off switch for gene expression and resistance to epidermal pathogens. This on-off switch for um, uh, resistance to infection also regulates other phenotypes, including tolerance of proteotoxic stress. So um, we've looked at this a couple different ways, but we commonly just look at survival after heat shock. And here, under conditions where half of wild type worms die, our PALS-22 mutants have increased survival that's reversed by a loss of PALS-25. And there's studies of many different um, uh, pathways that regulate heat shock resistance in C. elegans, including conserved insulin signaling and heat shock resistance pathways. And in those cases, usually you have increased resistance to heat shock, you also have increased lifespan. In our case, we're seeing that PALS-22 mutants actually have decreased lifespan, which again is recovered by loss of PALS-25. So um, this on-off switch for genes induced by infection thus leads to resistance to natural pathogens, shortened lifespan, and increased tolerance of um, proteotoxic stress. And um, I'm showing you this, uh, the, the results are published, but it's acting in parallel to these triggers um, of viral and microsporidia infection. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about um, what we know in terms of what are the mechanistic um, sort of basis for this increased proteostasis capacity, and this is uh, related to these um, ubiquitin ligase components that are upregulated by infection. And ubiquitin ligases are in charge of transferring ubiquitin to target proteins, and one of the largest groups of ligases are these multi-subunit ligases that um, are skip colon F-box ligases that, um, interestingly, in C. elegans, are um, the F-box adapter proteins are some of the most rapidly evolving genes and have expanded in the C. elegans genome. C. elegans has also expanded the core components um, of ubiquitin ligase, these um, SCF ligases. So, Kirthi Reddy had found that we didn't expect just one gene would completely reverse PALS-22 phenotypes, but we found just deleting this um, cullen, which is one of the core subunits, will reverse the um, thermotolerance of PALS-22 mutants and appears to be acting independently of canonical proteostasis pathways. So, more recently, um, we've identified what uh, factors, what subunits CULSICT is acting together with. And this is from a collaboration that we've had um, with Eric Bennett here at UC San Diego, who's really a world expert in ubiquitin ligases and um, proteomic approaches. And this was spearheaded by um, a postdoc in the lab, Joanne Panic, who's now a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Newcastle. And he was joined um, by a current postdoc in the lab, Spencer Gang. And what um, 
Juan did was took a strain of C. elegans that expresses flag tag col6 and did co-immunoprecipitations to find which proteins were enriched for binding to col6 compared to a control protein. So we knew that there should be a ring domain protein associating with col6 because that's what brings in an E2 ligase to transfer ubiquitin onto a target protein. And almost all colon ring ligases act with a protein called RBX that contains a ring domain. And C. elegans has that, but we didn't find it in the proteomics, instead found a different gene that we named RCS1. And through genetic analysis showed that RCS1 acts together with col6 to promote thermotolerance. So this graph shows you PALS22 mutants that have that increased heat shock resistance that can be suppressed if you've lost col6. And it's only we see a phenotype for col6 if this IPR has been activated um, in a PALS22 mutant. So similarly, if we knocked out RCS1, it had no effect in a wild type background, but would um, suppress very strongly the increased thermotolerance of PALS22 mutants. So if RCS1 is acting together with COL6, we'd expect that there shouldn't be any additive effects by the triple mutant, and indeed that's what Joanne saw, um, the triple mutant being the same as the double mutants. So I won't go through um, too many more details with this, but just do want to emphasize something somewhat interesting, I think, with respect to viral restriction and um, innate immunity, which is that RCS1 is in the trim family of proteins, which is a family of single subunit ubiquitin ligases that, to our knowledge, had not previously been shown to act in multi-subunit ubiquitin ligases. And so we named this um, gene RCS for ring protein acting with colon and SCRS. So Juan and um, Spencer identified the other components of this multi-subunit ligase and showed that there's redundancy, either SCR3, 4, or 5 can act together in this, this complex. And where we expected redundancy, we saw the opposite of redundancy. So through scanning through FBOX adapters found, it's actually two separate adapters that are required. Spencer found that um, either you knock out FBXA75 or FBX158 alone, it will suppress that increased thermotolerance of PALS22 mutants. So altogether, um, this was uh, published uh, earlier this year, and we're really interested, of course, to understand what's the target here and the fate of that target. And here I can just comment that there is um, some uh, preliminary results we have from Mario, who's a technician in the lab working together with Spencer. We were expecting that this would act through the proteasome, but we have genetic um, uh, pharmacological evidence that's acting through the lysosome. So just very briefly in these last couple minutes, I want to comment on some additional um, unpublished data. So we're still pursuing, these play a minor role in regulating pathogen resistance, um, and we're trying to figure out which other components are, are filling that role. I will say that through additional screens um, from Vladimir Lazatish, uh, we've learned um, in particular, he's characterizing a transcription factor called the ZIP1 that regulates some, but not all of these genes. And the postdoc, Elin Techley, found a really interesting um, regulator of the IPR through forward genetic screens, that of purine metabolism. And so here's a mutant in purine metabolism she found that has IPR gene expression considerably on. And um, here we do have an ortholog in mammals. So this um, PMP1 mutant she found is the ortholog of a human purine nucleoside phosphorylase that when mutated in humans leads to immunodeficiencies. So um, Elin together with Crystal found that PMP1 is keeping off all of, pretty much all of our IPR genes. So it's another switch for this response. And she found also in collaboration with Wendy Hanna-Rose's lab, it's behaving like the human PNP in that it's um, important for converting nucleosides to free bases by clipping off that sugar. So that's just showing you some of the data here with PMP mutants having increased inosine and decreased hypoxanthine. And these mutants with all these IPR genes on has increased resistance to NPCI when we look at pathogen load. So, um, and uh, all of these inputs, as I mentioned, go through the ZIP1 transcription factor and purine metabolism. We're really excited and Elon's pursuing actively um, what aspect is really kind of the trigger. Um, but overall, we think altered purine levels might be an indicator of intracellular infection which um, sort of from a, a wide perspective uh, may really make a lot of sense given that microsporidia don't appear to make their own nucleotides really. Um, and some of the very few virulence factors described for microsporidia are transporters that steal purine nucleotides from the host. And also viruses are completely dependent on the host for purines. <laughs>
So just to summarize, oh, and also thanks to Alina for um, allowing us to collaborate with her to try to um, do some analysis of whether these effects are conserved in some way in mammalian cells. So just to summarize, I've told you about this natural pathogen that can restructure its host to facilitate its life cycle, including turning organs into syncytium to facilitate spread of the parasite. I've told you about what we've learned of um, a specific ligand and receptor that triggers this common transcriptional response to a virus on microsporidia, and that some of the outputs that I think we've learned that, you know, by studying these uh, natural pathogens have taught us about a new kind of proteostasis pathway where we have a newly defined ubiquitin ligase complex that's promoting improved proteostasis. Um, and yeah, so with that, I would, I think I've acknowledged everybody as I went along. I want to thank, of course, our collaborators. Um, these are pictures of the lab back when we could be less than six feet away from each other. Um, there's positions available. And yeah, thanks again to Alina and Carla. It's just really been a pleasure to be part of this seminar series. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. It's terrific, your science, how much uh, you have advanced uh, to help us understand the intracellular pathogen response. So thank you very much. And uh, as you know, we don't ask questions uh, live after these seminars, but instead we use Twitter. And so uh, Emily has agreed to uh, answer the questions via Twitter. So I will share a screen here explaining uh, how you will ask questions via Twitter to Emily. Uh, let's see. Can you see the screen? Yeah, I can see the screen. Yep. Okay. So basically, uh, what you need to do is go for the uh, look for the count global immunotox and then uh, uh, find the tweet that says ask questions for Dr. Emily Tremel seminar here. Uh, replay to that tweet with your question and mention the hashtag global immuno and Emily will use her personal tweet uh, account, Twitter account. Uh, at Troemel Emily to answer the questions. So thank you again, Emily. That was uh, very educating. Uh, I learned a lot from your seminar and I already have a question that I will uh, not text you and I, I will <laughs> ask you via Twitter. And so thank you everyone for joining and looking forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Bye. Thanks, Elida. Bye-bye.